The Tolkien Road, Episode 86, The Lord of the Rings, Treebeard, Part 3. Hey there, fellow travelers. Welcome to the Tolkien Road, a long walk through Middle-earth. On this episode, we continue our journey through The Lord of the Rings with the third part of Book 3, Chapter 4, Treebeard. Before we get started, why not hop on over to iTunes and leave The Tolkien Road a rating and feedback. It's a great way to show your support for the show and takes less than a minute. Thanks for listening, and enjoy. Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Tolkien Road, Episode 86, Lord of the Rings, Book 3, Chapter 4, Part 3. Are we ever going to get through this chapter? I was wondering the same thing, actually. What do you think the chances are that we'll actually finish talking about this chapter on this episode today? Uh, I don't know. I'm not much of a betting man. Um, Just give me a percentage. 100%. Oh, yeah? Mm -hmm. We're going to finish it no matter what. No matter what. All right. Even if if an asteroid falls on this little recording studio of ours we're gonna finish this Don't darn episode jinxes. yeah <clears throat> all right well sorry listeners you heard it here get cozy well if you actually hear this then that means that i was right so you already know i'm right oh, unless yeah. somebody found this you know and just we're like you know we're, we're like dead and smushed and they're like well just as a last tribute to john and greta we're gonna salvage this recording and put it out there wow but then you've probably already heard about it on the news. This uh, this conversation's taking rather morbid. Well, turn you're the one that asked quickly. about odds. Well, I wasn't thinking that you'd bring asteroids and sudden death into it, so. Yeah. Well. Um, I, my, I was thinking maybe we would have a fourth episode on this chapter, but. Oh. You're saying no. Nah. Nah. All right. All right, so get comfortable, guys. We're in it for the long haul today. That's right. Well, there's not that. I mean, there's not a ton left. It's just a, it's a long chapter. Okay. And, um, you know, we decided we weren't going to be hasty. We're going to take, the, we're going to take our we're gonna, time. We're going to do the Intish thing. And, uh, you know, I'm glad we made that choice because again, you know, the thing with Tolkien, the whole reason we do this podcast is to, you know, take a long walk, a long yep. walk through Middle Earth, right? Yep. yep. We're, we're stopping not just to smell the roses, but we're stopping to smell every single individual flower, no matter how funky looking. You know, right and how or how funny it smells, and you know, even if we're not quite sure, it's not gonna like you know bite us when we try to smell mm-hmm. it. We're smelling that. We're smelling it. We're smelling Dosh it. Garnet. Gosh, Dosh Garnet. Yep, I just made that up right here on the spot. You heard it here <laughs> first, folks. <laughs> if I hadn't said anything, were you just gonna let that go, like <laughs> pretend like you hadn't done it? <laughs> Maybe. Dosh Garnet. That may have been my plan. <laughs> All right, right on. Um, yeah, but we have a lot of haiku today. We do have a lot of haiku left because so, we have a lot of haiku to do for right. this chapter. Because I know I finally have one that I can do. It's about time. I know, right? I feel like a slacker. Um, well, the shoe fits. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. Do we have any like <laughs> notes or anything? From yeah, our- we had a we had a note from a listener named Chris, uh, and all he said was Chris, uh, that his name was Chris. Okay. So, but what he said was. As follows. Oh, I thought you meant that was his only message. Hi, my name is Chris. The end. <laughs> he said, uh, "He said, I've, hi, I've been listening to and enjoying your podcast for quite some time. Awesome. Regarding the Entwives, it seems that Tolkien himself was intentionally ambiguous about what, about what truly happened to them. However, letter 44 of Tolkien seems to have a clue. Of, of Tolkien seems to have a clue. And he, and he links to something off of the Entwives, uh, off of TolkienGateway.net. Oh, okay. He says, keep up the great work. God bless, Chris. Awesome. Well, thanks, Chris. Thanks for reaching That's out. That's really cool. I actually, so it's actually letter 144, because I looked at this before, and it actually references letter 144. I'm not, let's see what letter 44 is, just since he brought that one up. I don't even know what it is. I'm um, fascinated by the Entwives. I'm glad we had an excuse to talk about them again today. Uh, it's a letter 44 is actually a very short letter from a letter to Michael Tolkien. Uh, though a Tolkien by name, I am a Suffield by taste, talents, and upbringing. In any corner of that country, Worcestershire, 
Worcestershire. Talking about the sauce? Worcestershire sauce. Worcestershire yeah. sauce? Apparently Tolkien invented Worcestershire sauce. You heard it here first. Man. However, Fair Squalid is in an indefinable way home to me, as no other part of the world is. Your grandmother, to whom you owe so much, for she was a gifted lady of great beauty and wit, greatly stricken by God with grief and suffering, who died in youth at 34 of a disease hastened by persecution of her faith, died in the postman's cottage at Rednall, and is buried at Bromsgrove. Well... That's about his grandmother? Well, that's about Michael's grandmother, who was Tolkien's right, mother. Right, Tolkien's mom. She died when she was yeah. 34. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah. Uh, you Let's know, Chris, one. I don't see anything in there about wives. Don't make him feel bad. It was a simple typo. <laughs> I'm Come I'm on. Being, I'm being you know you've done the I, same thing. I'm just missing. Mm-hmm. Why do you gotta be like that? I'm not mm-hmm. making anybody feel bad. I'm just looking out. I just look at I just like give, I like, That's all. I like, you know, messing around. If I'm not messing, it's like, you know, if I'm not messing around with you, mm-hmm. then I might not like you. You know what I'm saying? Like, I mess around with people that I like. Oh, that's why you're always messing around with me? Uh, yeah, that's Making me right. feel, like, yeah. dumb and stuff? Dumb and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, Dosh, guard it. Stop it. <laughs> All right. I really like that. I did that on accident, but I think I'm going to start doing it on purpose now. Yeah, well, there you go. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. Letter 144 actually says this about the ant wives. Um... <clears throat> Tom, he's speaking. He he speaks he speaks previously of Tom Bombadil in this letter. And by the way, it's a letter to. It's a long one. This is a, one we're gonna have to do on the show eventually, to Naomi Mitchison, uh, who was reading proofs, um, mm. and wrote Tolkien with a number of questions. Okay. So, <laughs> I have to imagine. Like it's funny to me to think of like people proofreading The Lord of the Rings like for the first time before it had ever come out, and they're just like, okay, um. I have one or two questions. <laughs> First of all, what the is going on? <laughs> you know, <laughs> say what? Yeah. 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 Um, but uh, the last last with good old JRR. All right. So anyway, yes. this is a Tolkien uh, a letter a Tolkien to Naomi Mitchison. This is a letter to Naomi Mitchison. Uh, Tom Bombadil has no connection in my mind with the Ent Wives. What had happened to them is not resolved in this book. He is, in a way, the answer to them in the sense that he is almost the opposite, being, say, botany and zoology as sciences, and poetry as opposed to cattle breeding and agriculture and practicality. I think that, in fact, the Entwives had disappeared for good, being destroyed with their gardens in the War of the Last Alliance, uh, when Sauron pursued a scorched-earth policy and burned their land against the advance of the Allies down the Anduin. They survived only in the agriculture transmitted to men and hobbits. Some, of course, may have fled uh, east, or even have become enslaved. Tyrants, even in such tales, must have an economic and agricultural background to their soldiers and metal workers. If any survive so, they would indeed be far estranged from the Ents, and any reproachment would be difficult. Unless experience of industrialized and militarized agriculture had made them a little more anarchic. I hope so. I don't know. Mm-hmm. So basically Tolkien's like, I don't know. Yeah. Um, but it sounds like, as Chris was, Chris was pointing out, that uh, Sauron, the big jerk... He must have destroyed most he of them. He did something bad to him. Yeah. So, so that's the story of Ant Wives. Yeah. Chris, thanks for writing in. Yes, Great hearing thank from you. you. Absolutely. Please do so again. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, let's give let's give Chris a golf clap for being the only person to write in on this particular episode. Well done, Chris. Good job. Well done. All right. And um, all the rest of you, write to us next week. T- seriously, and Chris too. Yeah, and Chris too. Just. Just like write a letter and be like, "What's up?" Yeah, that'd be awesome. <laughs> that'd be awesome if you did what Greta thought I was. I said you did. You just wrote and you said, "Hi, I'm Chris." <laughs> <laughs> Bye. Hi. I would. We'd read hey, that on we air. We would totally read it on air. But probably only the first two or three like that, and then we'd be like, "Okay, guys, stop it." Yeah. Put something of worth of like worthwhile and substantial in there, yeah. please. Yeah. At least write us something about like beef jerky or something like that you know oh yeah we need to send that guy our address so he can maybe send me some beef jerky that's what i'm saying yeah um what was his name again uh you had to ask me that i know you're not supposed to ask me that on the air on the spot i'm sorry his name was his name was captain awesome beef jerky man that's right why could i not think of that yes um anyway if um hopefully he's listening right now Mm mm-hmm and if he is, um... Oh, wait, what's I'm his gonna... name again, Greta? Huh? What's his name again, Greta? Awesome. Captain Awesome Beef Jerky Man. That's right. Um, and I'm going to shamelessly, right here, right now, just ask if he would send me some beef jerky. There you go. Because I love some good I'd beef like jerky. I'd like some, too. 
Well, you I asked first. You hoard it all for yourself. Yep. You've, and if you've you... learned nothing from reading these books. You learn nothing. Oh, well, maybe I have. Maybe it's just not what you wanted me to learn. Learn from hmm. Sauron and Saruman. Hmm. Yeah. Melkor. Hmm. Whatever. What have I done? Whatever. I've created a monster. <laughs> all right, let's talk about uh, let's talk about Treebeard. Let's do it. All right, so when we left off last time. Um, Treebeard sang that really sad song about the Ant Wives, yes. and um, and then he was like, "All right, let's go to Ant Moot." Um, right. And <clears throat> but before we really talk too much about Ant Moot, we have to consider something very important. From the outset, we need to know what's a dingle. What's what, a dingle? What's a dingle? Yeah, because like it takes place at a place called Dern Dingle, and and then there's a part. Wait, what takes place in a Entmoot. Oh, Entmoot. Oh, I thought Entmoot yeah. was the place. Entmoot takes place at, at Dern Dingle. And, um. Dern Dingle. Right. That Dern Dingle got me again. Dern, Dern it. Dern Dingle. Dern Garshnart. <laughs> what in the world is that? I want to roll. <laughs> uh, well, isn't the Dingle like. It's a good it's thing a... you can podcast because we would we have never been on the radio because we mess <laughs> things up so much. <laughs> But we mess up on purpose. That's what makes us cool. That was, that was a mess up on purpose. That was a mess up on purpose. Of course it was. Um, right. So wait, a dingle is obviously a place, right? Is it kind of like a valley? Yeah. Well, at some point, Treebeard's like, you know, oh, I can tell you guys are probably bored with all of our <clears throat> chatting, right. our ant speech. So um, he says, you and Mary uh, can stroll. He tells Pippin, you and Mary can stroll about in the dingle if you like. You mean after they've gotten to Entmoot and the Entmoot right. has convened. right. He tells them you can go... Well, what do you think? I thought... I pictured it kind of like a valley. Well, fortunately, there's this thing called a dictionary. Oh. And it's we can use there? that. Uh, it, it is a um, dingle, according to the new Oxford American Dictionary. Okay. Is a deep wooded valley or dell. Oh, I was right. I was right. I was there right. You go. I didn't picture the woods, but I pictured a valley. Yeah. Well, they're in the woods, so that makes sense. That's true. Yeah. That's true. But good job. I mean, you did better than I did. I didn't know what the world of Dingle was. Oh. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. More imaginative than you are. Uh, it's apparently it's from Middle English and denotes okay. a deep abyss, and it's of unknown origin. Um. So there you go. It That's what a Dingle is. Middle English. Yeah. Cool. All right. So now. So they're having their their um end moot their conference in a Dingle as well. In a Dingle. Okay. Yeah. All right. All right. Very good. So there we go. Um, they are, they're Ant Mooten and a Dingle. Ant Mooten and a Dingle. Dang, that sounds like something I would be a part of. Right on. And, um, so, uh, they're, so we'll, we'll, let's back up a second though. They're on their way. So Mary and Pippin are on their way. And, um, and it says, uh, Treebeard began to slacken his pace. Suddenly he stopped, put the hobbits down and raised his curled hands to his mouth so that they made a hollow tube. Then he blew or called through them. A great hoom, hum rang out like a deep-throated horn in the woods and seemed to echo from the trees. Far off, there came from several directions a similar hoom, hum, hoom that was not an echo but an answer. Hmm. So, apparently, Just... this is the place you go if you want to get the rest of the ants' attention. Right. Yeah. It's like a gathering yeah. place. Mm-hmm. Um... And is this like, sorry, did you say they're using like a horn or something? No, it's uh-huh. a horn-like sound, I think is what they said. Oh, but they yeah. use their, just use their hands. Or their, their voices, mouths. yeah. Okay. Um, rang out like a deep-throated horn in the woods. Okay. So. Um, so that was kind of like the call to, call, call to, to meet. meet. Yeah. Call to moot. Yeah, call to moot. Um, at end meet. No, yep. Call to meet at end meet. Um. And so what's interesting is that as the Ents try to gather, um, we get to see what they appear as through the Hobbit's eyes. Mm -hmm, And it mm -hmm. says, they had expected to see a number of creatures as much like Treebeard as one Hobbit is like another, at any rate to a stranger's eye. And they were very much surprised to see nothing of the kind. The Ents were as different from one another as trees from trees. Some as different as one tree is from another of the same name, but quite different growth in history. And some as different as one tree kind from another, as birch from beech oak from fir. There were a few older ants, bearded and gnarled like hail, but ancient trees, though none looked as ancient as Treebeard. And there were tall, strong ants, clean-limbed and smooth-skinned like forest trees in their prime. But there were no young ants, no saplings. Altogether, there were about two dozen standing on the wide, grassy floor of the dingle, and as many more were marching in. 
So, you know, at least 24 ints show up here, and they all look just like, you know, they all look like ints, but they all look completely different from each other. Right. They're different types of trees. Right. Well, and I guess they represent different types. You know, they, they, right. they're the ints for different types of trees. Right. And, yeah, um, right, yeah. Uh, and there's more coming. There's more than just the 24 that are coming. Right. Um, yeah, it's interesting. It's an, I mean, it's an interesting point, like, you know, how, that, how different they are, but um, I don't know if that's too, I don't know if that's too unusual. I mean, if you think about it, like a hobbit, Hobbits can be, you know, pretty different. I mean, human beings, for crying out loud, we can, we come in like all kinds of different shapes and sizes. You know, mm -hmm, you like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, you go here in Tennessee where we live and you're going to see, you know, I mean, in America, we live in an increasingly diverse society anyway, but, you know, let's, let's just go back to England where Tolkien would have been from, right? In yeah. the mid, you know, especially in his time when he was writing this in the forties and, and fifties, um, you know, most of the people around were going to be like white kind of Anglo-Saxon, you know, Northern European kind of looking people. And, um, but you know, if you had gone into, uh, China at that time, or if you had mm -hmm. gone into Africa at that time, you would have seen just incredible diversity in the way people look. Right. Right. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. So I don't think that's too surprising. That so the that hobbits had no reason to be surprised by the diversity of the ants. Well, I mean, I, I don't, I don't maybe, know. If... Or maybe it just shows what a you know, how sheltered maybe the I think, Shire was. I think through the Hobbit's eyes, they would probably, you know, it's probably pretty amazing, right? Yeah. Because they, I don't think it, you know, I mean, we don't know, but they, they don't seem to be particularly diverse. I mean, I think the way Tolkien would have envisioned them, and this is this is just kind of conjecture, but, you know, I think he, he had in mind like a Hobbit is just like a little like kind of English Englishman, you know, like an ancient mm -hmm. Englishman, right? Who's right. just like farms, you know, just like a farmer, right? You know, yeah. Um, so he probably had like in in his mind that they all looked kind of similar to one another. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anyway, we we actually know though from if you remember we reading uh, concerning hobbits at the very beginning of reading Lord of the Rings, except you know many episodes ago now. Um, one of the things it talks about in there are the three different like races of hobbits. Oh. I don't know if you remember right. that. That's right, yes. Of, of halflings. And um, and so you have some that settle in the Shire. You have some that... And, and then, like, the one that Gollum was once upon a time mm -hmm. um, would have been a completely different race from um, from who the hobbits were. Yes. So it may, this may just be more That's of a, a, this thing of, like, um, the hobbits' own provincialism, you know? Like, yeah. you know, they, they're just not used to seeing things that are vastly different from they are. Yeah. From what they're used to, I would agree with that. All right. Yeah. Anyway, did you have something you want? You have you got your book open. I'll let no, you read something. No, I was trying something. to find out. I was trying to see where you were. Oh, okay. All right. Um, okay, so the ants converse, um, and uh, and so what it says is when the ants had all gathered around Treebeard, bowing their heads slightly, murmuring in their slow musical voices, and looking long and intently at the strangers, then the hobbits saw that they were all the same kindred and all had the same eyes. Not all so old or so deep as tree beards, but all with the same slow, steady, thoughtful expression and the same green flicker. So they can tell mm. after they once they look in their eyes, they can tell that they're all, you know, they're all the same type of creature, right? right? They can kind of get that picture going on. The eyes are the window to the soul. There you go, right yep. on. That's interesting to uh, to think about, you know, because mm -hmm. like when you you know, you, a person can be extremely different from you in terms of their outward appearance, but if you look in their eyes, there's a certain way in which that. Is able to yeah. make a connection with them. Absolutely. And yeah. I feel like even among like family members, the eyes can be very, you know, they, they can really define a particular family. You know, you say, oh, those eyes are, you know, this family's trait or whatever. Mm -hmm. You know, they can be very distinctive. They're a very distinctive feature. And so at that point, good point, at that point, um, the ants decide that they are going to have a conversation and they begin, mm -hmm. they begin talking in their language. Right. So, um... It, they begin to murmur slowly, and then first one join in, joins in until in, in another, and until they're all chanting um, in kind of this rhythm. So it's almost like their their conversation forms a song. Yeah, which is interesting. That is really interesting. Yeah, I was kind of thinking of it as like a you know like maybe it was something so much like a Gregorian chant. Yeah. Something. Hmm. You know, just but like very deep. Deep. Yeah. Slow. You know, kind of melancholy. Tune. Right on, yeah, I can. Yeah, I can dig that. Yeah, um, I'd kind of like to hear that actually. 
I would too. Uh, and Pippin seemed to enjoy it, but it, it eventually it kind of his interest trails off. Um, he thought it was pleasant to listen to at first, but gradually his attention wavered. It's um, probably pretty uh, monotonous. To somebody yeah. who doesn't understand the language. And there's a funny little note here. It said, you know, whether you know, he started to wonder eventually whether they had gotten past Good Morning. Yeah, um, right. <laughs> yet. Right. You know, seeing as how unhasty they are. Yeah, he's been listening to them for a few hours now. And he's like, I wonder if they actually finished saying Good Morning to one another. <laughs> Uh, but Treebeard is understanding. He's an understanding fellow, and so he he uh, um, he says something to Pippin at one point. He says, "You know, you are a hasty folk. I was forgetting. And anyway, it is wearisome listening to a speech you do not understand. You may get down now. I have told your names to the Enmoot, and they have seen you, and they have agreed that you are not orcs, and that a new line shall be put in the old lists. That's awesome. We've got no further yet. Uh, but that is quick work for an Enmoot. So." They've decided that the hobbits are not orcs. Definitely not orcs. They've all got that out of the way, and they've decided they're going to add them to the list of uh, creatures, creatures of Middle Earth. That's right. That's uh, that's I would say it's a win-win for yeah, the you hobbits. Know, small small victories, but yeah, you know, totally. we'll take them. Um. So, um, and then he says there are still some words to speak before the moot really begins. I will come and see you again and tell you how things are going. So, so really, they haven't. It's almost you know they haven't really begun. Right. Gotten Their out actual, of business. Yeah. Right. Um, so Mary and Pippin get down, they go walking in the dingle, mm-hmm. and, um... By singing a jolly tune. While singing a jolly tune. Mm-hmm. Um, and they talk about, they start, they begin discussing Isengard. Um, Pippin, you know, Pippin's wondering yeah. where Isengard is. Yeah. So... Like where, kind of trying to get his bearings. Right? Yeah. Yeah, because yeah. they've been being carried around by Treebeard all this right. time through the forest, you know, right. how you can get lost doing that. Yep. Um... But uh, but Mary seems to have a good feel for it, and he says Isengard is a sort of r- a ring of rocks or hills, I think, with a flat space inside, and an island or pillar of rock in the middle called Orthanc. Saruman has a tower on it. There is a gate, perhaps more than one, in the encircling wall, and I believe there is a stream running through it. It comes out of the mountains and flows on across the gap of Rohan. It does not seem the sort of place for ents to tackle. But I have an odd feeling about these ents. Somehow I don't think they are quite as safe and, well, funny as they seem. They seem slow, queer, and patient, almost sad. And yet I believe they could be roused. If that happened, I would rather not be on the other side. Why do you think Mary knows so much about Isengard? Well, didn't we talk, like, didn't he study the maps at Rivendell? Didn't we discuss this? Because I thought it was Pippin. Oh, <clears throat> right. But then we agreed that I was right. And it was you, were, you were right. I'll give you, yeah. We'll yeah. go back and Okay, I didn't really, I, did, I guess I didn't realize that those maps were so detailed that he would have learned all this from those maps. Yeah. Okay. Well, and maybe there was other information that he read while he was there as well. That's true. You know, that he was able yeah. to gather while yeah. he was there as well. Mm-hmm. Um, but I agree with him. I wouldn't want to get on the ant's bad side either. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Pippin has the, you know, the interesting little note, which is, you know, um, I, I kind of, he kind of likens them to an old cow who just mm-hmm. you know, sits there chewing cud and you're like, that beast is really like, you know, annoying or mm-hmm. like, not, not annoying, but like, I don't know what, where the world that came from. <laughs> the sound of the chewing Dosh grass garnet. is so right. annoying. <laughs> it's just grating uh, on my eardrum. <laughs> <laughs> annoying. Darn annoying uh, cow. <laughs> darn annoying. Maybe were you trying to go for uh, docile? Yeah, just. <laughs> Their cows just sit there and they just judge you. And that's annoying. That's what I was going for. Oh. Um, they just sit there and they judge you. They just chew their cud. They're like, just shake their head slowly. They shake their head and look at you yeah. with their piercing eyes. No, but you're right. The docile is the right word. They're just, they're just like, they're just hanging out, right? They don't yeah. care. They don't care. They're just like. As long as they got their grass and their water, they're good. They're good. Um, yeah. But Pippin makes the good point. You know, I wouldn't. You know, I wouldn't want a cow to. You know, a big bull who's sitting there chewing a cud to all of a sudden come charging at me. No. You know. No. It'll take you out. It'll destroy you. Mm-hmm. You know. Mm-hmm. Um. So that's what we're thinking about. That's those are the terms in which we're thinking about tree beard and the ends. Um. So they can quickly turn from an old cow. Mm-hmm. To a charging bull. Exactly. Is that what they're saying? Yes. Yeah. Um, so after after a bit more, they, they kind of hang out. They continue hanging out. The Ents are still talking. And eventually Treebeard, uh, there's a pause in the Ent moot. And um, they see Treebeard coming to them with another Ent. And this is um, Bregalod. 
um, and Elvish. His name is Bregalod and Elvish. Um, and Bregalod is a hasty int. I thought that was an oxymoron. No. For an int, he's pretty darn hasty, right? Uh, he said, he's the nearest thing among us to a hasty int. Mm. Uh, you ought to get on together. Goodbye. And Treebeard goes back to the, uh, to the ant mood. Uh, Bregalod is described as tall, and he seemed to be one of the younger ants. He had mm-hmm. smooth, he had smooth, shining skin on his arms and legs. His lips were ruddy, and his hair was gray green. He could bend and sway like a slender tree in the wind. At last, he spoke, and his voice, though resonant, was higher and clearer than Treebeard's. Ha, ah, hmm, my friends, let us go for a walk," he said. "I am Bregalod, that is Quickbeam in your language, but it is only a nickname, of course." They have called me that ever since I said yes to an elder ent before he had finished his question. Also, I drink quickly and go out while some are still wetting their beards. Come with me. And, um, and so Quickbeam, you know, picks up the hobbits and Mm -hmm. they go for a laugh. Mm -hmm. Um, quick, or they go for a walk. Quickbeam likes to laugh. That's what I was trying to. I was going to say, I've never heard that expression before. What is going for a laugh? Sounds like a very it sounds like I'm a very like, British thing to say. I'm just like you know you need to you need to interject more because my brain is like you know substituting. I'm interjecting plenty. You are interjecting plenty, but I'm saying you inter- inter- interject more because okay. my I'm doing things like calling cows annoying <laughs> and saying let's go for a laugh. So I think that, I was gonna say I thought that honestly I thought that may be like a British expression that I'd never heard before. Let's go for a laugh. Any point a point and a laugh. Probably is. Probably is. Probably so is. So you shouldn't. Beat yourself up over that. Yes. So they go for a walk. Mm-hmm. And they're singing and they're laughing. They're having a jolly old time. Yes. Yes. Jolly good time. Yeah. Um, and it turns out that Bregalod, Quick Beam, mm-hmm. is... And see, that's what I get. I'm being hasty. I'm trying to rush through this thing. That's what you get for being hasty. Treebeard is punishing you right Just call now. Just me, call me Quick Beam. Mm-hmm. Um, so whenever... Uh, quick beam whenever Bregalod sees a row on tree he halts a while with his arms stretched out and sings and sways as he sings what's a row on tree by the way I have no idea let's look up a row on tree a row on tree I thought it was cool too how they said how much he liked to laugh they're like yeah he laughed when the sun came out from behind a cloud he laughed when they came upon a stream he laughed and at the sound of a whisper in the trees he laughs a lot Apparently, this they is a Rowan tree. They should have called him Laughing Beam. Yeah. That's a Rowan tree. How do you say it? Rowan or Rowan? I, I'm saying Rowan. Hmm. It's pretty. Yeah. Is that fruit on there? Uh, I don't know. Or are there know. flowers? It's like an interesting sight. Uh huh. Does it have, like, is it, um,. Is it touted to have magical powers or like? Oh wait, wait, you're just going up. It said the Rowan tree. Oh. Well, anyway, I just wanted to look at it. I just wanted to look at it. I wonder what it's, it's I just significant. Wanted to look, is. I just wanted to look at it, and oh, okay. we'll we'll um, we'll look at it later. Um, it is beautiful. It's a pretty tree, though. Yeah. yeah. So that's a Rowan tree. Uh, you can go look up a Rowan tree if you want. Um, and Quick Beam was a, apparently a big fan. He was he, apparently a row on trees were his were his trees, right? Mm-hmm. Um, oh, so he was a row and end. Maybe, maybe that's what maybe that's how we're supposed mm. to understand it. So okay. he says there were row and trees in my home, so, uh, row and trees that took root when I was an enting many many years ago in the quiet of the world. The oldest <clears throat> were planted by the ends to try and please the ant wives, but they looked at them and smiled and said that they knew where wider blossom and richer fruit was gro- were growing. Yet there are no trees of all that race, the people of the rose, that are so beautiful to me. And these trees grew and grew, till the shadow of each was like a green hall, and the red berries in the autumn were a burden, and a beauty and a wonder. Birds used to flock there. I like birds, even when they chatter, and the rowan has enough and and to spare. But the birds became unfriendly and greedy, and tore at the trees, and threw the fruit down, and did not eat it. Then orcs came with axes, and cut down my trees." Ants and trees, man, they just don't have any friends. No. Nobody's on their side. No. Um, so yeah, I guess I guess those were big berries that we saw okay. in that picture so of the rowan tree. That the birds yeah. are eating. Okay. Um So um so Bregalod has a little song that's kind of a lament for um for the rowan trees. I'm gonna try and try and read this thing. Yeah, good luck. O Orofarne, Lazimista 
Carne Marie, O Rowan fair upon your hair, how white the blossom lay. O Rowan mine, I saw your shine upon a summer's day. Your rind so bright, your leaves so light, <clears throat> your voice so cool and soft. Upon your head, how golden red, the crown you bore aloft. O Rowan dead, upon your head, your hair is dry and gray. Your crown is spilled, your voice is stilled forever and a day. O Oro Farne, Laze Mista, Carne Marie. Good job. <coughs> yeah. Well done. Yeah, sorry about the cough, everybody. I'm getting over a cold. Mm-hmm. Uh, kind of sort of. Mm-hmm. It's rude and annoying. So, on the air. Sad, sad song. It is a sad song. Yeah, it is a, a lament. But it's, uh, but it's a pleasant enough sound that the hobbits fall asleep. Yes. Very uh, soothing. And, you know, there's not much that goes on in the Entmoot for the next day or, you know, next day or so. Um, right, they spend a couple more days with, uh... Right. A, with a second night came and still the Ents mm-hmm. held conclave under hurrying clouds and fitful stars. Um, at sunrise on the third day, the Ents' voices rose to a great clamor and then died down again. <clears throat> As the morning wind on wore on, the wind fell and the air grew heavy with expectancy. The hobbits could see that Bregalod was now listening intently, although to them, down in the dell of his ent house, the sound of the moot was faint. Eventually, in that afternoon, a silence comes over everything. Um, and that's kind of strange, because I guess there had been all this, you know, basically they'd just been hearing the ents kind of doing their chant thing. The ent conversation right. had been going on, and so all of a sudden it gets quiet. You know, And like, the, the worst thing, even more, even worse than like, you know, something super loud and scary, is like, this extreme quiet silence absolutely yeah, yeah. and you're like oh something's mm-hmm. about to happen right yeah um <clears throat> so it's quiet down right right and sorry then, i had to clear my throat yeah and then after they got quiet there was a loud ringing shout right right so we come we come with a roll of drum tarunda runda runda ram we come, we come with horn and drum. Taruna, Runa, Runa, Ram. And then Bregalod's like, all right, let's go. Picks up the hobbits and they're off. Yep. <coughs> um, so Treebeard is at the lead and he's leading the ants and they're off uh, to Isengard. To Isengard, the ants cried in many voices. To Isengard. Why don't you read this little poem here? To Isengard, though Isengard be ringed and barred with doors of stone, though Isengard be strong and hard as cold as stone and bare as bone, we go, we go, we go to war to hew the stone and break the door, for bowl and bow are burning now, the furnace roars, we go to war, to land of gloom with tramp of doom with roll of drum, we come, we come, to Isengard with doom we come, with doom we come, with doom we come. The job. Thanks. That's a. Uh, that would be scary to hear. That would be scary. I wouldn't want to be at Isengard if I was. It has there. a nice flow and beat to it. Yeah. You can very see martial. them marching. Yeah, yeah. Very martial beat. Yeah, absolutely. So they sang as they marched southwards. Um, and you know, Merry and Pippin are amazed by the change. They you know they expected they expected the Ents to act, but <clears throat> they're kind of like. The way they just mobilized, and they're mm-hmm. just like they made a decision, and now they're going. They're actually doing it. Yeah. Yeah. They're, <coughs> they're like, pretty amazed by they're, that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and they're glad they're on their side. I'm sure. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Um. So, um, Pippin says the Ents made up their minds rather quickly. After all, didn't they? Treebeard says quickly. Hmm. Yes, indeed, quicker than I expected. Indeed, I have not seen them roused like this for many an age. We ants do not like being roused, and we never are roused unless it is clear to us that our trees and our lives are in great danger. That has not happened in this forest since the wars of Sauron and the men of the sea. It is the orc work, the wanton hewing, rarum, without even the bad excuse of feeding the fires that has so angered us, and the treachery of a neighbor who should have helped us. So they're mad at the orcs because the orcs are punks mm-hmm. and just do stuff just to be punks. Yep, yep. And they're mad at Saruman, Saruman because he should know better. Right, so Wizards right. ought to know better. They do know better. There is no curse in Elvish, Entish, or the tongues of men bad enough for such treachery. Down with Saruman. Mm. Ruh-roh. Yeah. It's like, you know, 
um, what's that old song? Um, if you don't, uh, I had it in my head just a minute ago. Um, what's it about? What made you think of it? You don't spit into the wind. You don't mess around with the old Lone Ranger, and you don't mess around with the earth. Um, oh. don't, you don't pull the mask on the old Lone Ranger. You don't mess around with Jim. Oh, it's like, right, right, right. Um, it's like an older song, right? Yeah, it's an older song. Yeah. Anyway, I can't remember exactly how it begins, but anyway, it made me think of that song. It's like, you don't mess around with the ants. Oh, no, you no. didn't. Mm-mm. Oh, man. But you did. Sorry, Mom. Now you're going to be sorry. You are going to be sorry, Mom. Um, now. It's very sorry. Sorry, Mom. Very sorry, Mom. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, Mary says, will you break the doors of Isengard? <laughs> will you really break the doors of Isengard, right? Because they said they were going to. Right. And he's like, really? Really? You Tree guys like, do that? <coughs> Treebeard says, you know, we could. That's right. Why don't you read that little passage? I need to clear my throat. <coughs> Maybe you should just leave. Maybe. Okay. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> I don't know where to start. Uh, oh, I see. Oh, um, well, we could, you know. You do not know, perhaps, how strong we are. Maybe you have heard of trolls. They are mighty strong, but trolls are only counterfeits. Made by the enemy in the great darkness, in mockery of Ents, as orcs were of elves. We are stronger than trolls. We are made of the bones of the earth. We can split stone like the roots of trees, only quicker, far quicker, if our minds are roused. If we are not hewn down or destroyed by fire or blast of sorcery, we could split Isengard into splinters and crack its walls into rubble. Yes. That's interesting that they were that the trolls were made in mockery of the ends. It is, it is. Yeah, I mean that's really the point I wanted to highlight there. Um, yeah. You know. Again, it's so just, his orcs are yeah, made in mockery like of the elves. elves, right? And those things are like obviously, you know, and those imitations or those things that are made in mockery mm-hmm. or those things that are made to not highlight the natural qualities, mm-hmm. right? Or to improve upon those natural qualities are never going to be even close. Mm-hmm. Right, they're gonna just be <clears throat> evil, dark. Well, it's interesting to think too. Impressions. Like you know, orcs and trolls are like they're monsters, right? Like they're they're made for almost like for one purpose. Mm-hmm. They're made to be like just weapons. Yes, you know what I'm saying. Yes, it's like they're for it's an evil like purpose. Morgoth took you know elves and ants, and he made his own versions of them that were just meant to be weapons instead of right. like. You know, real living organic creatures, right? Mm-hmm. Um, With a good purpose, right? Yeah. Um, and so, you think about that. Ents and elves aren't creatures of war. They can they can fight some wars, mm-hmm. definitely. Absolutely, yeah. You know, the elves, yeah, worthless. Lots of great elvish warriors. Mm-hmm. Um, we're gonna see what the ants can do here, but that's not their purpose, right? You know, right. but for orcs and trolls, that's their purpose. So it's interesting to think that like orcs and trolls, even though they're made to be weapons. They're actually not as powerful as weapons when because that's the only thing they were made right, for. Right, exactly. It's like this kind of short sightedness. Very short sightedness. You know? Yes. Kind of that immediate gratification <clears throat> kind of thing. Right. And they've you know, at the end of the day they're they're unnatural. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. So there's no way that they could even hold a candle to you know, things that are natural. Right on. And meant to be. Preach it. All right. Yeah. Okay, so um, so the Ents are all roused. They're all ready to go. Mm-hmm. And Treebeard freely admits they may be going to their doom. Yep. Um, Treebeard says, likely enough, uh, of course it is likely enough, my friends, that we are going to our doom, the last march of the Ents. But if we stayed at home and did nothing, doom would find us anyway, sooner or later. That thought has long been growing in our hearts, and that is why we are marching now. It was not a hasty resolve. Now at last, now now at least, the last march of the ants may be worth a song. I, he sighed, we may help the other peoples before we pass away. Still, I should have liked to see the songs come true about the ant wives. I should dearly have liked to see Fimbrathel again. But there, my friends, songs like trees bear fruit only in their own time and their own way, and sometimes they are withered untimely. Um, <clears throat> so, you know... They're perfectly, you know, part. I guess part of what they discussed in the Ant movie was that, you know, they could all die. This could be the last March of the mm-hmm. Ants. Um, 
what they realize is if they don't do anything, they're most likely going to be There won't be any marching ants. Right, yeah, exactly. There, won't be any more, there definitely won't be any more marching ants. So they got to at least ants. try. Yeah, they got to try. Right. And it, and maybe if they, even if they march to their doom, it'll still be this, this stuff of songs. Right. You know? Exactly. Which, They'll go down swinging. Given the importance of music and, mm-hmm. and Tolkien's universe, that's mm-hmm. a pretty good thing, right? To have a song sung about you that's a beautiful Absolutely. You know, memorial. To Absolutely. You. Yeah. If you're going to go down, <clears throat> if you're doomed to go down, you might as well go down swinging. That's right. Right? Dosh Garnet, mm-hmm. you might as well go down swinging. Might as well. You ain't got nothing to lose. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. Um, so the ants go on. They can, you know, they, they, they go on towards Isengard on the mm-hmm. march. And um, they've got a little bit of a ways to go. Um, sun goes down, and uh, they're still on their way. Um. And Pippin knows that it seems like their numbers have grown, even as they've been marching. Um, he said, it says, where the dim bare slopes that they had crossed should be, he thought he saw groves of trees. But they were moving. <clears throat> Could it be that the trees of Fangorn were awake and the forest was rising, marching over the hills to war? He rubbed his eyes, wondering if sleep and shadow had deceived him, but the great gray shapes moved steadily onward. There was a noise like wind in many branches. The ants were drawing near the crest of the ridge now, and all song had ceased. Night fell, and there was silence. Nothing was to be heard save a faint quiver of the earth beneath the feet of the ants, and a rustle, the shade of a whisper as of many drifting leaves. At last they stood upon the summit and looked down into a dark pit, the great cleft at the end of the mountains, non Kuranir, the valley of Saruman. Night lies over Isengard, said Treebeard. Hmm, ominous words. Mm -hmm. Ominous words. Ominous indeed. <clears throat> so, um, interesting. Got, There's like the forest is literally like following. Yeah, the literally ants. following them. They've got quite an army. Yeah. Moving. So it's not just the ants apparently, but like some of the trees. Yeah, some of the other trees are following. You know, come alive. We'll find out more about them in a later yeah. chapter. What's what's up with that? But, um, yeah. So. Quite a cliffhanger. Yeah. Well, we got a lot of haiku to read. Okay. Um, because. That's right. Everybody wanted to write haiku about this chapter, but they all wrote it about like the last third. Last, yeah. So let's do well, let's, haiku. Let's get into it. <clears throat> um, I gotta, I gotta pull up the song. Let's see here. Are you maybe up for singing? You and your cough tasticness. I'm gonna try. Okay. Dosh darn it. You better. I'm gonna do my best. All right. Um, where is that song? Why don't you just pull it up on your computer? Well, I, you know, I don't know. Hmm. Well, I hope you find it soon because I'm getting bored. Ah, oh, there it is. Just in time. I was about to leave. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen syllables in haku. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen syllables in haku. Boom. Nice. Got it down. Oh, yeah. All right. So you have a haiku for this one, right? I do. Do you want to go first, or do you want to go uh, yeah, last? Oh, sure. No, I'll go first. Do you have <clears throat> Do you have one? No, I did mine in the very, like the very first episode we did on oh, this chapter. Oh, right. Okay, so I'll read mine. Okay. Slow, queer, and patient, mighty when roused, off to war, Yavanna's giants. Nice. Mm-hmm. Yavanna's giants. Yavanna's giants. Right on. Yep, yep. Mm-hmm. I love that description, the slow, queer, and patient. Yeah. I had to use it. Nice. Yeah. Good job. Thanks. Do you have any more, or is that the only one? No, that's the only one. Okay. All right. Well, next up, we got um, we got two from Aaron Thiessen. Aaron. Um, I'll read one, and then you can read one, okay? Sounds like a plan. All right. Saruman fells trees, a mine of metal and wheels. Ents march on to war. A mine of metal and wheels. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. That's a good, I There's love that, that description of... I was going to say, it was that Trivia industrial, yeah, industrial mindset. Yep. Nice. All right, here's the second one from Aaron. When winter comes and darkness falls, meet me on the road into the west. Mm. Boom. I like it. Drop the mic. Mm-hmm. Walk away. Mm-hmm. Except then Mary Grace comes up and picks up the mic. Oh, right. Yeah. All right, that's All okay. Right. 
All right. There, Should you go, go for it. All right. We Mary have what? Grace. She has three? She has we three. We already read one of them. Uh, <clears throat> I don't think no, we've read, any, think we've of read them. any of them. Okay. All right. Uh, I'll go first. There, you go first. Old Here. ants, tree herders, weathering the storms of time, now rise to fight back. Weathering the storms of time. Mm-hmm. It's like the Empire Strikes Back. Oh my gosh, she did not. <laughs> Sorry. Shame on you. Although I'm sure Josh loved it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right, <clears throat> moving on. Here's Mary Grace's second one. From Pippin's perspective, the Ents are marching. I managed to persuade them. On to Isengard. Oh, from Pippin's perspective, yeah, that's, part of the haiku. Yeah, so, so read it without Oops, saying this. Sorry. So this is from Pippin's perspective. So this perspective. is from Pippin's perspective. My yeah. apologies, Mary Grace. I'm sorry. Okay, here we go. This is a haiku written from Pippin's per- perspective. Pippin's perspective. Say that three times fast. That, 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 that. Yeah, ha, ha, whatever. Okay. The Ents are marching. <laughs> I managed to persuade them. On to Isengard. Nice. Boom. I like it. All right, this one's from Saruman's perspective. I am Saruman. None shall defy. Or will they? Inconceivable. <laughs> nice. That's awesome. Little Princess Bride. Oh, that's in right. There. Little Princess Bride action Perfect. going on there. Very good. All right. Josh. Josh. All righty. Um, I liked his. I thought his was funny. Yeah, was his funny. is funny. All right. You want, you want to read it? Sure, I'll read it. <clears throat> this is from Josh. My favorite scene. The Ents towards Isengard March. Can you please rewind? Nice. <laughs> That's great. That is a really good scene. Yeah. It's super well done yeah. in the movie. Yeah, absolutely. Nice, Josh, as always. Mm-hmm. Well done. Nailed it. All right. Um, Rob. Rob Fangman. All right. Uh, I'll read this one. Okay. He's got two, but I'll read the first one. Shepherds of the trees, slow to wrath, but quick to laugh. The wise Onodrim. I like it. Mm-hmm. I like that. Should We should all be slow to wrath and quick to laugh. Absolutely. Shouldn't we? Yeah, that's a great this point. This world would be a much better place. Mm-hmm. Yes. All right, here's Rob's second haiku. The march of the Ents, to hew stone and break the door, to doom go the Ents. Mm-hmm. I like it. Really good. Man, you guys are haiku ninjas. That's right. Mm-hmm. Like for reals. I know. Awesome. All right. All right. Uh, I think that's we've a wrap. created like an army of haiku, haiku. haiku warriors. Haiku warriors. Yeah. Warrior ninjas. That's right. Yeah. All righty, peeps. All right. That's a wrap on uh, chapter four, Treebeard. Next time we will discuss, you know, so next chapter is um, the White Rider. Who could that be? Hmm. The White Rider. The White Rider. Who could that be? Hmm. Um, so, book three, chapter five. Right. Uh, I think we'll do that in two parts. So, okay. uh, we'll probably... So, here's the deal. Next week is Thanksgiving week. So Happy Thanksgiving! Yeah, Happy Thanksgiving, everybody. We're thankful for all of you, Absolutely. seriously. Absolutely. Um, for reals. The fact that anybody listens to us blab on about Tolkien, you know, is just awesome. So, thank you to all it of is. you. It's mind-blowing. Next week is Thanksgiving, and um, so um, I had a point. Yes, haiku. So we'll probably end up having to record earlier in the week. Oh, right. Yeah. So if you want to get your haiku in for the first part of that chapter, you can either you can... So if you really want to get it in for the first episode of that first part of that chapter, you can do it on... uh, You need to have it in by Monday, so Monday the 21st. All right. Okay. Um, actually, I'm even going to say Sunday. You need to have it in by Sunday, the 20th. Okay. All right. All right. But if you just want to wait and get it in the second part of that chapter, we'll probably, you know, you can probably just have it in like, you know, the normal time the following week. So like Wednesday of the following. Like the Wednesday after Thanksgiving. Wednesday after Thanksgiving. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So. Um, Sounds oh, like for, a plan. So for folks in England and Australia and other and New Zealand and other places. Um, they don't celebrate Thanksgiving, so oh. so FYI, Thanksgiving is an American holiday. I'm sure they know what it is. You, you think they, they do celebrate it? Yeah. I mean, like in Canada, they have a different Thanksgiving. We have Canadian listeners, so Canadian yeah. listeners are just all messed up right now. They're like, like what? what? Thanksgiving was back in October. Right. What are you guys talking about? That was about? last month. Y'all are behind the times. Um, 
I mean, who knows what all of our Legion of fans in Sweden are even thinking right now. Seriously. You know? Yeah, I'm uh, sure they've heard of it. I mean, America's, you know, I mean, we study other cultures. Surely they've studied American culture. But I don't know when all the English holidays are. That's true. Good point. Well, Thanksgiving, okay, fine. Thanksgiving is an American holiday. We get together and uh, we eat a lot of good food. Mm -hmm. And we give thanks. And we give thanks for all the things we're thankful for. Right. And it's on the last Thursday in November Mm -hmm. in America. Which is next week. That's right. Yep. So that's why why we're talking about Thanksgiving, in case you didn't know. Well, now that we've got that cleared up. All the people in all these different countries are like, John and we all know what Thanksgiving is. See, which I tried to tell you. Oh. But then you made me doubt myself. Just in so. case. Just just in case. Just in case. If you know what Thanksgiving is, you should have turned us off like three minutes ago. Mm-hmm. But oh well. Oh well. All right. Well, thanks for listening, guys. Party on, everybody. Yeah, party on. I'll catch you next time. Thanks for listening. Please remember to check out truemyths.org for show notes and plenty of other Tolkien goodness. Also, if you're enjoying the podcast, would you please leave the Tolkien Road a rating and feedback on iTunes? It's a great way to support the show and takes less than a minute. On our next episode, we'll continue our journey through The Lord of the Rings with Book 3, Chapter 5, The White Rider. Thanks for listening, and until next time, the road goes ever on.